Hello, and thank you for participation in the event. It's great to have you here. This is a technology-oriented conference, so it's safe for me to assume that we all have one thing in common. We use or want to use robot framework for various tasks. As with every technology, there are a few groups of users that we can distinguish. There are innovators and early adopters, the people who had used the technology before it was cool. Then we have early majority and late majority, and people who are reluctant to change or will not change their approach at all. Robot Framework had been around for close to 20 years now, and there are few among us that can call themselves early adopters. But is actually 20 years enough to be at the majority stage? We'll have to wait and see. Python wasn't in top 10 programming languages until 2001, and it took further 10 years for it to climb to top 5. There is one other thing that is certain in the IT world. People have preferences and quite strong opinions. That includes everything from the operating systems, like the Mac versus PC ad campaign, and uh, down to the editor battles, VI versus Emacs. One thing is for sure, the haters gonna hate. My name is Adam Hapner and I've been testing software since 2010. My interest in the field stems from being a Java developer for a year after completing my computer science degree. My development career started and ended in one of Polish startups and being in the team of four to five people with constant release pressure applied. I quickly noticed that our boss had preferred a so-called Klingon programming. For those unfamiliar with it, during such programming activity you can hear sentences like specifications are for the weak or 4,000 lines of code may be typed in one night by a fast coder. This very quickly turned my interest from how do I make software to how do I make software good. Since then, I've worked in Poland and Germany for various industries, mostly as a freelance test consultant, and I've seen nearly all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Scripted tests with estimated completion time of 12 hours one monster automation script driven by hundreds of Excel files, exploratory testing done right and done terribly wrong. I've helped form or restructure the testing approach in some projects and adjusted myself to the leaders of my industry in the others. I've worked with developers or alongside developers. I've even accidentally weaponized Confluence to allow my team to go for continuous deployment at one time. My first contact with Robot Framework was in 2011, back when it was relatively fresh technology, but I can remember it making a lasting impression on me. So much, in fact, that whenever I had a free hand in selecting the technology of automated testing, I tended to select Robot Framework. Now I'm finally building the skills and competences of others in my team. I choose the way in which our company, Nice Project, can undertake further testing related to challenges and I carefully guide my colleagues toward interesting technologies. Robot Framework once again turned out to be one of the right choices for us. But with so many years under my belt, I've heard quite a lot of negative comments about my favorite tool. A relatively recent submission to Hacker News prompted me to deal with it, like once and for all. This talk will be dealing with critique, but I wanted to make sure that we have all the same understanding of the term here. In Polish language, we have one word, krytyka, that conveys two meanings, creating a critique, a systematic study of something written, or formulating a negative opinion about something. In English, those two meanings have two separate words to describe them, critique and criticism. You could say that this presentation will be a sum of both those meanings. A critique of criticism of robot framework, if you will, because I intend to take the negative comments about robot and investigate them for merit. Spoiler alert. Some negativity is well deserved and I think that addressing it may make our community stronger and the product better for all. On the other hand, some negativity stems from ill-informed opinion or a lack of knowledge in the matter. And some of it is just a lot of bull. <clears throat> As the talk proceeds, I want to give you all a fair chance to participate and check sources for yourself in the future. I'll always include the link to the source that form the crux of the argument. Unfortunately, in the internet, the talk is cheap, so I was forced to paraphrase most of the arguments so that they fit on a slide. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the term death by PowerPoint, 
and I do my best not to do it in here. Second of all, many things that I will say will sound negative, but there have been a, quite a few pats on the back for robot framework developers. I do my best to include those as well, so, you know, we keep the spirits high. And last of all, an image tells a thousand words. And did I mention that I didn't want to PowerPoint you to that? Yes, I did. So that's why I will use graphics sometime to convey how I feel about something or to explain my point of view. Now we're ready. Let's to look at from where I gathered my sources. If you didn't know Hacker News already, I may only encourage you to visit the page from time to time. It's a great source of news from our industry and a very helpful community of like-minded founders, software engineers, testers, technical writers, you name it. Basically, if your job has anything to do with engineering software, there is virtually no reason for you not to read it. Unless, of course, you value your time, because it is a huge time sink and quite addicting. Robot Framework has been submitted to the news at least twice. Both times, the reactions were, mildly put, interesting. Third source is a Reddit discussion, which contains a surprisingly low amount of cat pictures in it. I guess the kittens don't sit particularly well with quality assurance crowd. Then there is a criticism of generally keyword-driven approach as a whole from Alan Richardson, also known as the evil tester, but it's not half as bad as it sounds. The HDEF site contains some points from a guy who was frustrated with robot framework and he decided to build his own tool. I don't judge, he has every right to do so as he pleased. But I felt somewhat called on when the marketing of his product is basically, it's not robot. And Quora, even though it's an old website with a very wide crowd, managed to round up a surprising amount of commentators in a question about our relatively niche technology. I should also say, this is by far not all the criticism out there. It's just what I found with some preliminary research. From what I, what, what I can tell, most other sites in the internet just repeat the same arguments, pro and cons, again and again. So it makes no sense to rehash it just for completeness sake. What do the people on the internet say? I've been very fond of Robot Framework for a long time. You can tell that the cartoon face on the screen is my face when I read some of the things. But enough chit chat. We're going in. Three, two, one. Let's start with something relatively mild. Burn it with fire. Look at it. Someone took extra effort to separate every word in it. And yet, no specific complaint, apart from it being used at Nokia, the company that helped create Robot Framework. Fortunately for us, the fellow commentators who shared the same sentiment and even often the same company background were quick to point out three critical flaws that they found painful to use. First of all, there is the issue of apparent enforcement of tabular test data structure. This is somewhat surprising to me because, as I see it, there are two main ways to define test case in robot. First of all, you can use the executable specification approach, where each sentence, each row in the test case is a sentence, and the sentence is meaningful, self-contained description of something that is useful to a stakeholder. With this approach, the test case does not even contain any tables. The second way is to use test case templates, the data-driven data approach. In this way, each test case is actually a set of test cases and the tabular data format is absolute godsend and very wished for. But apart from the technicalities, let's wonder why would we want to have tabular test data at all? There are actually several reasons. First of all, the testing is a methodical approach to verification. That means that we have to we should at least uh, apply test design techniques up front. And one of the test design techniques is called uh, decision tables testing. You may recall it from the ISAQB foundation. This technique is sometimes useful for increasing the test coverage with lots of inputs. And uh, this fits very well to the data-driven approach for uh, test drivers. 
The second reason for using the data tables would be specification by example and using the three amigos meetings to clarify the content of the test. Three amigos meetings are meetings that happen before the implementation even takes place. And they are used for product owner, developer and QA engineers, the titular three amigos, to come to a shared understanding what the request and functionality even does. You can think of them as a story refinement, but on steroids. The outcome of such a meeting is a set of acceptance tests and specific examples and test data. Unfortunately, those meetings are not so easy to achieve before, first of all, they have to take place before the implementation begins. So this eats up time before the, the sprint begins and they require the tester to have uh, quite advanced analytical skills, which comes with the experience. So uh, if you have a team that consists mainly of junior testers, it is not so easy to do. But when it works, it works wonders. Third reason for data tables is quite simple. If we have, then we should use test oracles. Uh, those are applications or people that we trust to produce valid results for our application to test against. I have already mentioned that one of my past projects included hundreds of Excel files that contain very specific test cases. Those files were output from a legacy system and the new system had a requirement that all the results must match perfectly with the legacy software. So there was one huge script that consumed all the various and variously formatted Excel files and tested extensively the new software. It wasn't pretty, but it definitely worked for this particular application. Last reason, even if the product owner is not a fan of data tables, it often happens that the subject expert is familiar with at least Excel or something similar, and uh, we are able to prepare test data in cooperation with the subject expert based on their experience without requiring the subject expert to lay out every single line of thinking that they do in their heads. Actually, expert-based testing is one of the best approaches that we can come up with. The fact that they may be unable to explain the algorithm does not mean that there is none. It just means that the algorithm has to be found and as much as the developers may be unwilling to accept this, it is our job to help developers fine tune the algorithm to the expectation of the subject matter expert. The next point, difficult to use remote library. This is the kind of thing that someone who has never needed to use remote library would say. Let's split this argument in two. Mm. First of all, we have to wonder in what way we can interact with any system. Actually, there are many ways. Let me just list a few. Depending on the system under test, you could, for example, use a well-formed API like REST, SOAP, or GraphQL, or use a web interface or a web browser to do the automation, or use the native or close to native uh, UI interface and drive any kind of UI automation framework to do the automation, like Appium, for example. Uh, you could use the file system to move files around or write to, to or read the files directly. You could use custom protocols on any of the available ports. You could use the database to manipulate the test data directly and probably many, many more. Thinking about it more closely, things are easy as long as we are using well-formed, well-known protocols that define over the network usage. In every instance, when we have networked application that has custom protocol, then we are probably better off implementing a remote server. What this does for us is standardize the way we communicate with the remote machine. And our biggest problem becomes not how to communicate with our application that resides on our remote server, but how to deploy our Python application or Java application 
to the remote server. And this is a known and effectively solved issue. For an example, in one of our end-to-end -end test cases, we have to emulate simultaneous usage of the central server by multiple clients. This is <clears throat> actually effectively a load test case. The case is not complicated. The clients have to be connected and just communicate normally generating network load and some, uh, some load on the central server. Unfortunately, the server is legacy and does not comply with any modern standards. The starting of network clients is not possible remotely and uh, dynamically starting the client instances like in AWS is not feasible for us due to architecture constraints. So we can do one of several things. We could, for example, attempt to capture and replay network traffic, which can get complicated very quick as the traffic can be encrypted or seeded with unique identifiers, or actually the development of the client goes on and on and the captured traffic may become outdated. <clears throat> we could also develop and maintain emulators which will take care of the communication, which again requires additional maintenance and involvement of, of the developers. Or we could use a remote library to establish a well-formed protocol to remote machines and just start the clients there and stop them there. I have to add that the remote server is quite unique in the testing world. In other frameworks, if you want to open a communication channel to a remote machine, you have to take care of such communication yourself, and that is quite a different can of worms to open. Okay, the third argument, the imperfect lookup. I have to agree that the syntax support in IDEs remains one of the toughest problems in the road framework world to date. Fortunately, in the recent years, with development of more and more standardized IDEs, we've also received more and more standardized support for programming languages and robot framework is no exception. There is this thing called robot framework language server, which attempts to alleviate the pain here. It is currently, it is currently closely bound to development of robot framework and it works relatively nice if the libraries and resources that we use in test cases are placed in somewhere that Python can find them. So in Python's Python path and not the robot framework's custom Python path. That is why I tend to encourage um, treating your libraries as software packages and just keep them installable via PIP. Another thing that can help during the development is quick keyword reference sheet. And this is very easy to do once we have the libraries and resources as installable packages and upload the documentation to one central place like the RF Hub 2. Okay, this is as much, as much criticism that I could extract from this URL. So let's go on. It's just Cucumber with extra steps. Now, now, let's not be quick to hate here. Cucumber actually did very much to popularize acceptance test driven development practices in our industry, and it remains to be an extremely popular test specification format, even branching out to languages other than Ruby or Java. But I have to admit, I understand some of the criticism towards those solutions, especially when they spill over to affect robot framework. Let's look at them one after another. First of all, what does Cucumber do? It takes a set of natural text instructions with some placeholder and maps them to appropriate functions in the base programming language. There's a little bit of syntactic sugar that allows you to define extra steps or extra setup or background to scenarios or at data tables, but then it all directly maps keywords to the code. Additionally, to my knowledge, Cucumber encourages, if not enforces, flat test file structures. So in this manner, the feature file, as it's called, is actually like English language, but then you have to immediately explain every sentence in very complicated code. In robot framework, 
you have a little bit more flexibility. If the keyword is actually something that you would call directly from underlying code, feel free. But even then you don't have to repeat yourself, because function names are automatically translated to sensible defaults. But if your keyword is only a slight variation, or even better, a rephrasing of some other keyword, you can just wrap it in an extra thin robot framework layer. Then it's robot all the way down. I would even go as far as to discourage usage of library keywords in test cases. I often repeat, libraries have no place in my test suites. That extra layer of abstraction is also absent in robot framework. I mean, you can add it if you want to, but it's mostly unnecessary. Because of this flexible nature, we can implement in Python as much or as little as might make sense. Okay, little code reuse. I like this one. Cucumber forces in a way that the actual system usage is hidden from plain view because only the worthy will have in, enough insight to carefully weave the programming language's functions to new keywords. And you face an interesting dilemma. You have to choose between using few, few keywords and rigid structure or loose structure and many keywords. kind of feels like there's no right or wrong answer here. Additionally, having set up somewhere somewhat localized to feature files doesn't do the code any favors in terms of reusability because you have to specify every setup separately. In theory, the scenarios should be short and understandable, but from my experience, few domains are explainable in such short terms. You usually need a bit more context. Robot framework with the nested test suites delivers exactly this context if you need it. You can place your specification at the exactly right place. Okay, write the test code, write the glue code, intent matters, develops prefer to code. It all seems like very slight um, variations to the same coin. Let's pick something from my industry where we deal with printing presses. I can imagine crafting a keyword similar to print document or document is printed. They both make sense in various formulations of the test case. They are very similar in syntax and mainly they are, are both valid. I can imagine both being used to communicate the intent of what I want to achieve. But where is the context for how to the document should be printed? Maybe it's in a test case, or in the test suite name, or even worse, only in the documentation. That's the kind of things that you can do with robot framework. Have those keywords only test case specific, and they shouldn't land in any shared resource. What the resource should contain is specific keywords for printing the document in many ways, and the test engineer in the test same file as the test case should be able to determine which way to use in which test case. Because maybe there's one slow flow using the UI that should be used in specific cases. And in the others, you can use a workaround using some API because you don't care about all the details. Think about it some more. How would we approach the same problem if the structure was more rigid? We could define two keywords print document using UI and print document using API. And to further, document is printed using UI and document is printed using API. We wouldn't care that much if the content is same or similar. There are ways around it, but the test case designer and worst of all, the business subject matter expert has to remember always to specify which particular way is important to him and in what way he wants to have his document printed. And every other person reading the code will have the same instinctive question. Why are we using the UI here and not the API? The explanation to this question would have to be given in the comments, which is not quite optimal. This blurs the intent. The intent was to have the document printed. We should aim for providing sensible defaults and leave only so much usable information to the test reader as possible.
we should backtrack here a little bit to the sad reality of multiple software projects. The truth is that the way to do the work is often figured out as we go and during implementation of the features. After a feature is implemented, testers test it first of all manually and select some keywords to automate the regression testing. Those keywords have to be then implemented in base language, pulling resources away from new and important features, so there is this instinct to not request new keywords, if similar are available, which can lead to the test cases that are kind of similar to what the tester had in mind. And of course, there's problem with the test basis. What, to, what do we test? It is often described separately, and both the tests and the documentation have to be kept in sync with the development. What we end up with is quite curious. First, if we get lucky, some keywords are provided and implemented, often based on a hunch or informal communication. Then the test designer adjusts the test case to what's available to him at the time and implements the test. It's insane. What we can do using robot framework is much more sensible. We start by describing the test case in a most sensible way. Then we use keywords local to the test suite to specify intent in greater detail. And only then do we look for some keywords that may prove useful. Only if we don't find some keyword already implemented in the base library, do we switch to the base language to describe the missing link. All other can be built upon the way that we construct the test framework repository. This actually enables us to exit discussions with a plan, which is for all intents and purposes as good as a complete test suite. What's missing is the implementation detail. Our description of the test case may then be treated as an executable specification or automated acceptance test or basis for an automation. The simple switching of perspective brings us great value in construction of the automated test suite. There are also positive sides of being compared to Cucumber. Basically, all of its strengths are also robot framework's strengths. Probably the most important thing here is those frameworks force us to actually use words to describe behavior and expectations. This means that we have to have human discussion and communicate with one another. But where Cucumber forces us to pick and choose from a dictionary of sentences, Robot Frameworks enables us to be more creative with the test case definition. Details of the test cases will follow if they are necessary. This shared understanding between technical and non-technical project participants is important. It forces the developers to also think of the system in terms of clearly defined expectations as well as clearly defined interfaces. Last point from the attached discussion I found is very interesting. It was a comment that a low-code solution as a robot framework should also understand context. These are the sentences like, if John logs in, he should see his profile page. In the last Robocon, there was this talk that actually proposed building such implicit context library. And the author of this talk actually came up with a proof of concept for robot framework. I have every intention to give it a go internally, but unfortunately we weren't able to allocate it allocate any resources to this effort this year, maybe next year. But even without this, using just the test case scope for variables enables us to not pollute the test cases with unnecessary details. The trick is not to use them in resource files, only in the test suite files. Anyway, my point was, it is com completely unknown to me if we were able to implement such interface, such implicit context way of thinking in Cucumber. Okay, that's it when it comes to comparison to Cucumber. Let's see what we have in store next. After comparing robot framework to Cucumber or other high-level test frameworks, 
it's only natural that some will complain about comparing robot framework with PyTest or any other low-level test framework. Just as PyTest, we could uh, use JUnit or NUnit or JES or JESmin, etc. in here. The base comparison is we have already a language that we can implement our tests in. And this is true. We can do all the things and more with robot framework and with those low level test frameworks. It is only a question of skill and maintainability. And yes, if we are employing Python developers already, we don't have a problem with them writing PyTests. Same goes for Java developers. The Java developers uh, are actually quite more happy with providing the JUnit tests as they are with providing robot framework or cucumber tests. But if we were to think about it in detail, how many Java developers do you know that really embrace maintaining the Selenium test suite? There are also various different considerations. So, for example, the remote server for robot framework is one example that comes to mind. If you use the low-level test framework, you have to use all low-level solutions. Robot framework requires some Python competence anyway, this is right, but the amount is negligible unless you want to do really wild things. I have already taught multiple people with limited Python knowledge basics how to extend robot framework. Comments after writing first Python keywords is usually, that's it. The most confusing part remains where to put the Python code anyway. Someone also mentioned that you need to be a developer to write good tests. I disagree with this sentiment. Actually, the developers are very needed in the software testing world, and we wouldn't have products without them to test. But the products that they provide need to be testable. We need their support to provide client libraries, mocks, simulators, etc. We need the developers to do good work and treat the testers as technical stakeholders in the product and maybe provide us with the debugging capabilities and clear error messages. I hate it when during the test of a web service, for example, I encounter only error 500, uh, the server has crashed with no, uh, no details inside. We need the developers to cooperate with us to fine tune the requirements and discuss the scope of testing. Some tests will be better done in low level test frameworks and some tests are better done in the high level test frameworks. And some tests are best done manually only. We also need the developers to uh, use the unit testing and integration testing to drive the design of the system themselves. And most of all, we need the developers to cooperate with the testers, with the quality assurance team, and not treat us like some people that are out to get them and destroy the good work that they deliver. We have all have the same goal. We need to provide the best product possible. But actually, a sentiment that I can get behind is one of my colleagues from the team who mentioned that if you are a developer with good testing skill set, then you are a very good developer. And if you are a developer but do not approach your software and your product as a tester, then there is much to be done to improve your work. Another set of complaints is basically complaining about the rigidity of the uh, framework 
or complexity of the framework on uh, or it being confusing basically you cannot satisfy all people some will complain about it basing to being too strict and some will complain about it being too too loose uh, some will find it too simple some will find it too complex but if we dig a little bit deeper in the argument then we will find that basic complaint is the requirement to use double spaces this is fair you need to use double spaces in robot framework but you could also complain about needing to use uh, tabs in Python or curly braces in Java or, or .NET. In my opinion, this is something that you just get used to. Also, the verbosity of the test definition language mm, leads to favoring descriptions of what and not how. So I have seen cucumber tests for example, where the setup's instructions for the test case consisted of 10 keywords. With Robot Framework, you can uh, just compose them to one or two keywords and explain yourself later in the file. Moreover, my recommendation is not to use overly complex keywords definition in the test. Uh, in my opinion, you should try to keep the keywords you use as simple as possible, at least on the test case level, and explain the details later as you go and deeper as you go. So it's completely fine to have all the details and all the possible default data in a low level resource that interfaces directly with some library. Uh, but if you are implementing a test case, you should only provide the most necessary details to, to the test case, the, the ones that are actually relevant to what you are describing. As for the structure and formatting of the code, uh, you can use something like Robot Framework Tidy and uh, actually automate the process. We internally use the Git pre-commit hooks and those pre-commit hooks uh, work in such a way that they execute robot framework tidy so that all the code is auto formatted all the time so we actually do not have to think about um, if the conventions are being kept or if someone uh, forgot about two or four or six spaces or whatever we may use And as to the complex control structures, my understanding is that they have been introduced mainly for the robotic process automation crowd, but there are times that they are useful in test cases as well. And actually the way that they have been implemented in the robot framework with uh, ability to specify the X amount of executions or execution timeout, uh, I find it quite fun and useful. And actually recently we had a test case that should wait for some visual queue from the software. And if this visual queue doesn't go away after some time, then the process can continue and we should continue with the test case, but we should note the failure of one assertion. So this is one time that the execution timeout on a loop actually came in handy. A quite a common complaint is also the prolification of keywords. So what it means is basically every team that uh, approaches the system and the automation of the system creates his or hers or there's variant of a keyword. So for example, someone asked, why do we have 18 different ways to log on or create a session? This is a very good question because 
how many different ways to log on to the system are there. Maybe there are 18 different ways to go, but most usually there will be one or two or three ways to perform some action and we should be able to execute each and every one of them but decide during the test case definition which one do we actually want to use because maybe it matters maybe it doesn't matter in my opinion the perfect solution is when the team that is responsible for some fragment of functionality maintains also the library and the keywords that describe how to use it. So maybe there are two teams, one responsible for API authentication, one responsible for the UI authentication. And each of those teams should be providing one package that we can use in order to um, verify if this way of the authentication works. Of course, we are speaking about authentication. It can be any other functionality. But the question comes up, how do you maintain your code? And the answer is, you create a package out of them. It is actually possible to package your libraries, so the most basic ways to interact with the system. And it is also possible to uh, package the resource files and the empty Python packages and also version them. And this way you can maintain a change log, you can maintain documentation, you can maintain um, basically the semantic versioning system and be able to tell the testers, hey, if you want to handle the new way of authentication, to the system. You need to use the library in version XYZ. The question that may come to mind when it comes to this uh, version packaging of the libraries and resources is how do we keep track of this? What's in which version? And the answer is we should treat the code of the libraries and code of the automation as our production code and actually provide the documentation in very great extent and use the toolset that comes with the community of robot framework and maybe push the documentation to RF Hub so that we can have one central location for maintaining all the uh, all the documentation of all the resources of all the files with the lookup function. In this way, when a test case is being actually implemented, not just designed our, but actually implemented, then you can look up which version of the library you need, place it in the requirements, and use the keyword directly as described in the documentation. A complex question in the robot framework world and generally in the end-to-end -end testing world is that debugging the test scripts is not an easy task and it often boils down to you make the fix, rerun the whole test suite and the fix is not valid, it's not fixed. You make the fix again and repeat the process and so until the fix is actually a good one. And a complaint that I've seen against robot framework is that it is easy to make a mistake that a compiled language like Java would expose immediately on compile time. That is a fair point, but I think that we can do quite a lot with static analysis and we also can try to mitigate some of the problems with the dynamic analysis. So actually, Robot Framework comes with this option to execute a dry run, and this effectively will 
try to parse all the test suites and execute all the resources, but skip the execution of all the test libraries. So the whole flow will get executed, but no interaction with the system will take place. This can be used to verify syntax validity of the script and uh, try to pinpoint potential issues up front. I always encourage uh, my test automators to run the dry run as often as possible. We are actually looking into a way to uh, combine the dry run with the uh, pre-commit hook. But as we are using robot framework to execute various test cases in various scopes and use um, argument files extensively, this is not as easy as I would like it to be. More tricky question when it comes to making some fixes is assignment of variables. This is a good one and this is also something that needs to be taken with extra grain of salt, especially if the variable assignments are done in a dynamic way using Python scripts. But what is good to remember is that the keywords can always reload some variables. So if you, for example, have variable files in YAML or you use the variable files that pull the data from some external resource, you can uh, use the keywords like uh, import variables to reload them to have the freshest state exactly where you need it. Then you can uh, make sure that no other keyword had polluted your namespace. Lastly, if we are doing as I propose and we are keeping the test libraries and test resources as packages that are installable, that means that we get to provide also a test suite and static testing of those uh, libraries and uh, test resources. And we should, why not? After all, the test code is production code as well. So how does this look in practice? In our company, we try to extract as much library code as possible out from the test repositories. And we tend to have small libraries. Uh, some have even one or two keywords only, but they are extracted to separate repository. And this separate repository undergoes style, style verification and it undergoes uh, regular unit testing because libraries that we provide are generally in the form of uh, Python files. It is easy to do with PyTest. After that, we tend to provide the test libraries also with some simple robot framework tests. And this is actually a good example of how we can eat our own dog food, so to say. Because if we can show using robot framework that we are able to use the library that we just provided with robot framework, uh, then this already forms a good documentation for anyone that will want to use the library in the future. The output of the robot framework tests and uh, creation of those usage examples is that at the end we generate and publish documentation of this library and push it to the RF Hub for all other testers to see. And a new version package of the library is published in our internal nexus so that the people responsible for test design and test implementation can update at the time that is convenient to them. So it, this doesn't have to be immediately, but uh, it tends to be quite quick after the uh, implementation of the new feature is complete. And this also means that we can um, maintain our library code quite clean if we sometimes find 
an issue with the library code, as it happens, then we can uh, issue a bug fix for the library code and go on with the improved version. Sometimes people also complain about not being able to catch some problems with the uh, software early. With Robot Framework, we can get around uh, the problem quite easily. So first of all, what uh, we quite often do is set the log level uh, appropriately during our CI-CD builds. And we leave those log files available only for a short time because we don't need to store all the details of execution. Uh, but after we are complete with all the relevant test executions, we combine the test reports into one test report and one test log. And during this uh, composition, we remove the unnecessary details. The fact is that there are certain people responsible for reading certain types of files and reports. So we as testers and as test automators, we are interested in mostly the uh, working internals of the test case. So we want those trace results. But uh, the people responsible for maintaining the stability of the software are under test. They only want to have uh, some minor details about the test case and mainly from the business point of view. They do not care which request passed or failed. They want to know about the actual implication from the end user perspective. And this we can achieve using the set test message keyword and uh, actually by building up the execution report from the test case from the keywords. And uh, for our internal purposes, we uh, use the trace logs and analyze quite a different set of artifacts. Another thing that we can do to ease the analysis of errors is to always try to customize the assertion messages. It is quite easy to just uh, write should be empty, should be null, should be true, should be uh, greater than and so on. But from the business perspective, it's quite difficult to pinpoint what the issue actually was if we do not add a little bit of context in this error messages. The built-in library already contains all the assertions that we could potentially need for most of the cases, and they all support custom messages, so let's use them. And last but not least, uh, when we are executing a test case, the biggest problem that I personally see is that the log file and the result file is written only after the test uh, run had been completed. If the test run doesn't complete in time or gets uh, aborted by the CICD um, pipeline for any reason, like a timeout, then those log files will be lost forever. They simply won't be written to, to the disk. One way to mitigate this risk is to always use a de debug file uh, from Robot Framework when running the test. We can ignore it in the later stages of reporting, but for making sure what went on, this one artifact is extremely important and extremely useful from our perspective. Okay, it's getting quite late and I know that my voice is uh, has a tendency to put people to sleep when I speak slowly. So I wanted to leave this talk with a bit of advice. There has been some pieces of advice along the way, but this one is probably the most important that I can think of. This is something that I picked up uh, years ago and uh, actually the longer I think about it, the more sense it makes to me. Uh, 
basically when designing test cases and test suites and uh, the whole architecture of um, our test framework we have to see our system under test synthetically and actually analyze which interfaces can we use to make contact with the system that we are testing and those interfaces as i mentioned in the beginning are uh, quite many and uh, quite wide and they are always very simple so rest api is not that complicated the file system is not that complicated database is actually not that complicated and we can use libraries on the side of robot framework to communicate directly with those interfaces in most basic way possible if you think about it the selenium library or browser library it provides only the most basic ways to interact with a web page the rest library it provides only the most basic ways to uh, interact with a rest api and so on and so forth the operating system library provides most basic ways to interact with processes and files this is a good thing and we should strive to emulate exactly this behavior but on top of those libraries we can create a dictionary of what makes sense in the context of our application and this library so if for example we use rest library to describe how we want to interact with our system through the rest api then this resource file above it this one for example this can be used to describe the specific workflow the creation of a resource the deletion of a resource the update of a resource but this resource already has some meaning in context of our system then we can combine several of those low level keywords let's call them that in the way that makes sense from the business perspective so creation of a resource through rest api is usually not enough to accomplish some business goal the business goal is for example a completion of a user workflow or creation of several resources or attempt to create some resources and rollback and assert the state of the system afterwards and the user workflow that we can create it may span several different interfaces and the object models for example they are from my perspective also uh, some sort of user workflow they describe the application from the end user perspective and using those high level resources we can in the end finally provide our test cases which will be described using the in test suite keywords and those in test suite keywords they in turn will use our high level resources to accomplish workflow workflows step by step i hope this proposed architecture makes sense to you and if we stick to it then the life will be quite better i guess the final word i had to say and want to to share with you is the one that i already said a couple of times today and that the test code is actually production code and we should maintain good architecture of the test code and we should maintain good practices and we should maintain good um, quality of the test code and if we do then robot framework is a wonderful tool to work with and it doesn't matter if we use this or if we have one conversion convention or another convention 
the, the goal is that we can use the collaboration tools provided by Robot Framework to make our life that much easier. Thank you for your attention and have a good, good, good conference. So actually we had some slight technical problems and we had to switch the person who will be asking me uh, your questions in the last minute. Uh, but fortunately, Krzysztof agreed to, to substitute. So um, tell me, what, what do you want to know? So yeah, this time is the other way around. I'm the, asking the questions. <laughs> so first question is that people say that robot framework is easy to start and hard to maintain as the test uh, grow. So is it true? In my opinion, uh, this is true with every tool that you do not use wisely. Uh, so if you cram all your, all your production code into one file or one class, then it becomes a hot mess. And the same is with robot framework tests or cucumber tests. If you just cram it all into one test case or one test suite and do not structure your code properly, then you end up with hot unmaintainable mess. So the, the goal is to apply your, your thinking uh, and architecture skills to actually describe your test cases and not the operations that you want to do with the system. And then you have the uh, clearer path to maintainability. Okay, so the next question is, was there a critique to which you changed your opinion? So example, for example, at first you didn't agree with it, but then thought it makes sense or the other way around? I had to think a long one about this one. Um, actually, the, the one critique that uh, most nicely fits this description is the one that you don't have to be a developer to um, that do you have to be a developer to write good tests? Um, and it's not that you have to be a good developer to write tests, um, but you have to have some skills that are uh, inherently um, related to developing software to be able to architecture your tests properly. And uh, this is something that is uh, unfortunately not taught in all those um, online classes because it's easier to just show you how to get started with robot framework, how to get started with PyTest, how to get started with uh, Selenium. And you uh, have to figure it out for yourself, how to keep working productively with your uh, test code. And uh, we can learn from the developers the approach, but uh, unfortunately, there is uh, still a little bit too, uh, too little um, education in this uh, regard. Okay. And do you have one thing which would you like to be happy to implement in Robot Framework? It's a doozy. Uh, actually, I wrote four things uh, at once, but if I have to pick one, I would say I personally would like to have better manual testing support, maybe even exploratory testing support with Robot Framework. Uh, this is because uh, at our company, we have a lot of uh, business experts and uh, too little manpower to actually automate all the things that we want to automate. But uh, that tests should be executed in repeatable ways uh, anyway. And we would like to have an uh, integral overview of uh, what the tests had been uh, executed and maybe combine it uh, also with the um, coverage reports. So. If we were able to uh, properly execute our manual tests as well as automated tests in, in one go and combine the reports in the end, it would be uh, very great. Mm, we already utilize in some uh, areas the, the uh, dialogues library from Robot Framework, uh, but it's uh, quite old and um, not anymore maintained. Mm, maybe we will develop something uh, on our own in this regard somewhere in the future. Okay. And um, which IDE uh, do you recommend for Robot Framework? I personally uh, 
do not see any um, added benefit of using advanced IDEs. So um, I recommend using either PyCharm or um, Visual Studio Code uh, because you can easily switch between the robot code and the uh, Python libraries if you need to. Uh, and it all also supports uh, developing the, the pipelines and all the other um, configuration files that you may need. And, and it's not limited to just robot framework then. OK, I think we can squeeze in one last question. Uh, which uh, CI CD tool do you use uh, with robot framework? It's uh, not that important. We, we use uh, GitLab, but you can use any one you want. Okay, I think that time for our QA session is up. So thank you for your answers and thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your attention and thank you for stepping in, Krzysztof. Um, now <laughs> we have uh, scheduled a lunch break for one hour. So we see and hear each other at 12.30. Have a nice meal and smacznego.